Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Honorable Marsha Caddo. All right, okay. So we having a fireside chat with the heat, but not the fire. We got the heat, but we ain't got the fire. <laughs> um, but like I said, we just want us to be comfortable conversation. So like, you know, it, it's not interrogation. We can just like take it easy. We can talk okay. this evening. I'm ready. And we know that you are the right person for this chat this evening. So it's really a pleasure to have you. It's an honor to be here. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so as a minister, you wear many hats, as we could tell from your bio. And what's not there, guys, is that she's just generally an amazing human being. Thank like you a very welcoming that. and warm person. <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah, so that's also a thing. Um, but you've worn many hats, managed many portfolios in both the public and private sector. And there are people here that don't know who you are. So you could just let everyone here know who is Minister Caddo. Well, first, uh, it's, it's an honor to be here and to have this um, conversation with all of you. Um, you started with the hardest question first, I see. Uh, I think um, we are here to talk about innovation and I feel that my work and life uh, has been one where I've tried to innovate in what I can bring to the planet. Uh, because that's why I think I am here, and I feel like I, that's why we're all here. Um, and I was just saying to Shaquem, who's with me, that I started out um, with a plan to do what I was good at and see how far that went. Uh, and so that meant that I uh, did linguistics and Spanish at undergrad level. Um, and f throughout my kind of academic life, I just, the idea of punishing myself academically was one that I never really was interested in. Uh, you know, there were all these notions about what one should do, what one should study, these, these subjects that will get you a scholarship and all these kinds of very strange things that they tell you, um, that they program you with in certain education systems. And I said, well, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm going to have to do what I enjoy. And I did. And I also thought that doing what I enjoyed was kind of the, the best way to feel useful and to, and to be successful. And my definition of success is how useful I am um, on a small scale or a large scale. And so I did the linguistics and the Spanish. Um, but I felt like ultimately what I wanted to do was to figure poverty out. Um, that, was, that was where I was. I grew up in a village in St. Michael in Barbados with poverty all around, including in my home. And by the time I went to, to secondary school, I realized at that time that other people lived different lives and that not everyone's life was a life of deprivation. And I thought, huh, well, how, how can we balance that so that there's less deprivation? And so I knew I wanted to look at the issue of poverty and how to get rid of it. But here I was doing this linguistics in Spanish. And then um, it occurred to me, you know, that the multilateral way, the UN system and all these things were the way to address poverty. And how do I get there? Um, and I thought, okay, Marsha, you're gonna have to abandon everything that you thought and study this economics because it seems to me that economics being about the provisioning of goods and services to people is the way to address poverty. Let's figure out how to get economic goods and services to more people in a more balanced way. And then I realized, oh dear, linguistics is not gonna get me there. <laughs> as fascinating as it was. Um, and so, but I did want to continue this, this Spanish um, speaking Spanish and, and being able to connect with Latin America. And so I decided, okay, I'm going to do um, my economics training in the Dominican Republic in Spanish. Um, and so I feel as if I've always, and we find that we always have to kind of change tack and find out where we can find um, our path um, in a way that we're useful. 
But I also feel that in many ways, innovation was all around me, even in the way that people have to find to survive and to avoid some of those deprivations that we talk about. Um, and so growing up, there are things that I would, saw, but I would see my parents use and reuse and repurpose uh, in trying to find a better life for the three girls that they, that they were raising. Um, that showed me always that there was a way to innovate as a, as a way to expand people's choices. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's kind of the environment in which I grew up. Um, and the idea of finding new ways to do things is always one that has resonated with me. The, the last thing I'll say on this is that there's also innovation in finding the spaces where you can have the conversations. That might not become apparent to you, right? Um, and so for me, I very much was interested in issues of social justice and women's um, sexual and reproductive health and all these things. And that's how I found my way to football because I played football for many years. And how did that happen? I'll tell you quickly. Um, I went to a football match um, in a community nearby here actually and um, I realized that the guys were playing and all the women who had come to watch um, were they were there watching they were there with children uh, and they were talking about some of the some of the challenges that they had um, and you know we realized then that this was a group of people with whom we could engage around a sport and then we could also have different conversations. And so that was kind of the, the way in which I ended up playing football around communities in Barbados and realizing, as I do now with my new football team, junior football team that I have in Britain's Hill, <laughs> shout out Valerie Youth FC. Hometown. Um, and I realized that using sport as well as a way to accomplish development is, is another way that we've innovated. Um, and so that's me, um, always finding ways to uh, figure out how do we expand people's choices. Yeah, and, and it, it seems like, you know, it's a story of necessity breeds invention and innovation. So that's actually very cool. Because sometimes you do things because you just want to, and sometimes you do things because you have to, and yeah. then you want to as a, late, you know, as a later step. Yeah. Um, so, so what would you say then, um, how would you define innovation like as a small, like in the context of small island developing states? Because we talked about Barbados and your experience, but like, you know. On yeah, so I think for, for small countries like ours with our history, I mean, our history and our natural environment really help position us with respect to innovation. Our culture and the way we experience it and where we have come from, in many ways, uh, is kind of where we can find the capacity to innovate. So, you know, a big part of, of what we have to offer is the way that Caribbean people do things, it is the way that we govern ourselves, it is the way that we organize in communities uh, to find uh, solutions to problems you know for example we have this notion now of, of restorative justice and the fact that really one of the things that we have to be able to deliver to our young people in our communities is a justice system that more closely reflects justice right natural justice uh, and not just punishment and so how do we get communities engaged in in that approach and the truth is that is a part of our culture and heritage, this idea of village elders and people coming together and saying, listen, uh, I know that he teeth your mango and you're very upset, um, but <laughs> what, what, are we, what, are, what can we do about it as neighbors? Right? That negotiation for justice is something that's very much part of the Caribbean story. Our natural environment, uh, and the way that we roast the breadfruit, which is the sweetest thing in the world to eat. Um, I, don't know, I don't know how many people still roast breadfruits. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, the, the way that we cook, 
the way that we gather, the way that we talk. Uh, I feel that we have, the way that we find peace in our societies. You know, when we reflect on the regions around the world, you know, and, and, and even as I say that, it is hard to have that conversation without thinking about what's happening in Haiti today. But the truth is that what's happening in Haiti today reflects a deep history of disenfranchisement um, that it regrettably is part of the story of, of the Caribbean. Uh, and, I, and I have confidence that our leaders in CARICOM and elsewhere are going to realize this for, I mean, it seems almost glib to call it a human tragedy, but something must be done. But largely the ways that we find peace and we govern ourselves uh, in the region, I feel that there, there are lots of lessons to share with the world in terms of what is the, what is the Caribbean brand of innovation. The Caribbean brand of innovation is, is our culture, is our history, uh, it is our resilience and how we have survived, uh, you know, continued efforts at oppression and how we have been able to demonstrate the things that, we, that, are, that we've originated, that are ours, our music. Um, and so I think that that's our brand of innovation. It's one that I actually don't feel that many regions have. And I'm happy that Future Barbados and others are helping us explore that. So, so we kind of have a, a picture of, of what the Caribbean innovation identity is, like you have an idea of where you think it should be, where it should get to, if we're not there? I think that we, yeah, I think that we take a lot for granted. I think we have to, where we should get to is want to kind of systematize some of these things that we're talking about. I use the example of restorative justice. Uh, sometimes I think that we don't in many ways, we take ourselves too seriously, and others, we don't take ourselves seriously enough. So we evolve things that happen in our communities, and we think that they're not, because they're not wrapped in a suit and tie, um, they're not wrapped in officialdom, then they can't be brought to bear on the official ways that we do things. And, and I, I disagree so much with that, you know. Um, I think that if we're able to document, well, what is it that happens in communities when people are able to find a solution to uh, an injustice that has happened in their community? What is it that they do? What is it that we can replicate? Even, even at a national level, you know, <laughs> we wear robes and wigs and we walk into a courtroom and we think that that's the only way uh, because that has come from somewhere else. But we have ways of, of dealing with justice, but we have to document them and we have to make them real and serious. Right? We have to, they're as serious as we make them, right? Um, and so I think that's one example. Uh, I also really want to see us understand our natural environment, uh, even as we try to protect it. Uh, and so we are doing quite a bit of, well, we have done quite a bit of work as a country and as islands around, uh, around the region on you know, sea defenses, making sure that we protect the coastal environment, uh, looking at issues of water security and so on. Uh, I think that we also have to find our innovation brand in the natural environment that we have in these islands that others don't have. So the island ecosystem has so much richness for not just products and services, but also how other ecos ecosystems around the world can, can, can operate. But I think we need to document and we need to test and we need to experiment, for goodness sake. <laughs> you know, I, I, I hope there are no people in this room, there's no one in this room who's right now engaged in a pilot of any kind. But I, but I, but I, I, do, I am not a fan of the word pilot because I feel that uh, we, except in, in extremely brand new, highly experimental cases, you know, like how they'll tell you um, before you do something, like test it on a corner of your, 
of your skirt or whatever to see if it will harm the fabric, like, like except in those cases. But I really would like to see us get more comfortable with the idea of experimentation uh, to see if something works. And if it doesn't work, to say, oh, well, that didn't work, and we're going to have to try something else. You know, we, I feel, are a little bit afraid of that failure. Not because of what we stand to lose in terms of dollars and cents or anything, but because we don't want to say that we failed. Um, and even that, the size of our societies, where we have a very small population, and I'm not saying that we're going to test radical, potentially harmful things in our population. That's not what I'm saying at all. But I'm saying that there's certainly areas of work. Tech is one of them. Um, you know, being able to analyze data sets for a small population, it's easy, it's doable. It's just us, right? And, you know, there's so many ways in which when I sit in a room with, with other policymakers, um, I say, you know, you can actually find every single Bayesian that this thing relates to. Like, I can go and find them. Physically. Physically, Physically yeah. I can go, I can find them now. And we can ask them if this is what they want. <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the innovation brand, right? That's the advantage yeah. of being the size that we are. And we need to use that some more. Capitalize on the small bigness. Exactly. Yeah. That's the best way. Yeah. <laughs> Large ocean state. Correct. Uh, okay, okay. So your portfolio demonstrates an intersection with science, industry, and technology. Um, how can Barbados position itself globally to take advantage of shifts away from typical versions of innovation in the global north? Huh. Um, well, I mean, I hope I started to, to, to talk about some of that uh, in some of what I've said. Typical approaches to innovation in the global north. Because um, you, ha you, have, you have mentioned a lot, because a lot of the time we talk about innovation in terms of technology only. But you have already started talking a lot about other aspects of innovation. Yeah, I, I think that, so the typical way is that you know, you have an idea, and it's, I think that the typical model of innovation in the Global North is very much focused on wealth creation at an individual level. Um, now, we want wealth creation, for sure. Uh, we definitely want growth that is job-led, that is inclusive, um, but we have other values that we need to bring to bear in our economic model, right? Um, and so the, 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 the typical approach where, you know, you have this product or service that you want to test, uh, you have to find financing, uh, you know, there's this kind of venture capital or other approach and you, it is a very kind of rigid way of testing something and finding the money, right? And, and, and the pharmaceutical industry is perhaps one of the biggest examples of that the best examples of that, where notwithstanding the collective benefit to society, uh, you know, we have a pharmaceutical industry largely in the global north that, that says, look, you know, I've done this research, I've spent all this money, now how am I going to get my money back? I'm going to have to charge you $300 for this tablet. That's not for the public good, right, in any way. So I feel that what we can do here is to have, again, a more values-based approach to innovation and how we, how we do R&D and why we do R&D and what is it for and how can we find things in our natural environment that, yes, generate wealth and jobs and income, but also generate wellness. That, I feel that's so, very much the Barbados brand, right? That this is where wellness lives. Look at the number of centenarians that we have, right? Um, you know, we famously say that George Washington House is there because, you know, George Washington was sent to recuperate because it was felt that Barbados was the only place where he could re recuperate from what ailed him, right? Uh, the model that we have for export Barbados is Barbados is life. That's our brand. Let's find a way to... This is going to sound ridiculous, but what is the way that we heal the planet? 
I think that Barbados is in a wonderful position to do that, along with our other countries in the region. Yeah. All right. <laughs> just that small thing of healing the planet. Exactly. Just that, that little, that. As that little pressure. Saying, we we can get that do. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. So innovation is adop adopted at different speeds, and sometimes it can be advantageous and sometimes not. Um, so what are your thoughts, if you have any, on the speed of adoption of innovation broadly and at all levels of society? <laughs> You want me to show working for this question? <laughs> um, it's funny that you ask that because I was just having a conversation today with uh, someone from one, one of the multilateral organizations and I said, you know, we measure development according to gross domestic product and uh, perhaps even the human development index, which looks at things like... Um, looks at income, but also looks at educational attainment and all these things. And we determine a country's level of development and also the kinds of global finance for which it qualifies according to these measures that don't at all show you everything. I've always thought that one of the measures that we should be using has to do with a country's capacity to readily adopt or adapt technology and other innovations. Because what you find is that there, there are many middle-income and high-income countries like Barbados that, have, that reflect a little bit of arrested development because the capacity that we have to adopt and adapt to new innovations is not very great. Um, and so I feel that that has to be one of the equalizers between the global north and the global south that we have to... Um, we have to contend with, um, that we have to be able to bring about. Um, and it is a really different measure of development because when I look at the African continent, the speed of innovation, of adoption and adaptation is far greater than ours. You think, you think maybe that is due to, or rather, what would you think it, that is due to, is it like a, a size thing? Is it um, historically, like where we've come from, our colonial history? Like what, what do you think in terms of that? Well, I feel that, again, we talked at the beginning about invention and necessity, right? Um, the last, the, the, the last two years before I came back to government, um, when I was working with Bold Center, one of the projects that we explored was um, being able to scale up ideas from young people um, living all over the place who had just developed this thing because they needed to use it now. Uh, and it was, that's, that's, that's all it was. It was, you know, I am living in a particular environment where I can't walk into a shop and buy this thing, right. or I can't order it on Amazon. I need this utility. I need this functionality. How do I get that? And in, and in those cases where we were trying to support those projects, it turned out that the engineering behind what they were developing was superior to the products in the marketplace. And they were doing it because they didn't have anything else. Perhaps we are a bit comfortable in that way. I also think that the way that we have framed our education system has been in a way, and thankfully that is changing now uh, with this education transformation, but it has been in a way that, you know, we prioritize accepted knowledge, right? So somebody has written some books and said, here, read that. That has in everything you need to know. And there's no play. There's no exploration, right? I want to play with something to learn about it. Um, and I find that in the jurisdictions that have faster adaptation of innovation, or faster innovation, they play more. And we need to play more. Yeah. I think I agree with you. Um, OK, so as a cultural practitioner, a creative artist myself, um, there's now a lot of talk and action 
around technology as it pertains to creative arts and innovation as it pertains to creative arts. And some people love it, and some people hate it. <laughs> some people think it's going to be the best thing. Some people are going to think is, this thing is going to be our destruction. So um, like, what are your thoughts on, I guess, what do you think us as, as creatives should see when it, when it comes to like, you know, these new innovations and specifically these new technologies? We all know we talk about AI and such, you know, I, as it pertains to our jobs as creatives. Yeah, well, I think that specifically for creatives, this is where I start to see where you have first where you have to manage risk i don't i don't ne i don't always go to the risk part first i go to the opportunity part first and then i come back around to the risk to say okay how do we protect ourselves and the population um in when it comes to intellectual property and creative content and output uh one of the things i think the industry is concerning itself with is well how do we protect what you have organically created from what you have just digitally generated. I think though that there is still this real appetite for organically created art. There really is. Um, that's not to say that there, all, there won't also be an appreciation for, um, for the opportunities that we have to use tech to create or strengthen art. Uh, but watching the evolution of AI applications to, um, to the creative arts, I still see that people are also really still enamored with, you know, an 11 year old who has tremendous vocal ability, right? Um, and in fact, the technology is allowing us to see so much more of that and to understand so much more of that, you know, um, and so I think that there are, that the opportunities definitely outweigh the risk. I also think that we're going to find new art. We're going to find new digital art that is interesting to consume. Uh, and that can also add to what artists traditionally do. But I do think it is a, is a space that has to be carefully regulated. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. I think maybe it comes down now to really looking into the regulation of it. And people might be able to see, to be more open to it when they feel a little safer. Like, yes. that's what you were yeah, saying. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Okay, so I think this is probably my final question. And it's a it's more fun one, maybe. <laughs> it might <I> be. <laughs> uh, if you could recommend a book, a podcast, a website, some, some form of reading or interaction um, to inspire innovative thinking, what would it be? Um, I'm going to pull up my podcasts <laughs> sorry um my podcast library um i i have two that i love two podcasts that i love um one is called indie hackers uh and it's really about um people who find innovative ways um to create companies and to uh generate products and services kind of outside of the mainstream of large tech companies or, or um, and then the other one is called Impact Boom, uh, which is stories from around the world of people whose products and whose innovative energies have really had a tremendous impact and are starting to have a great impact um, in terms of kind of social entrepreneurship. Uh, and I find that inspiring all the time. But I will say this. I feel like we are, we are all productivity apt out. So like we try, keep trying to find these hacks to make our lives more productive and to figure out how we should think, think like a this and think like a that. If I were to give, apart from those two podcasts, um, kind of recommend what we do to get ourselves thinking innovatively, um, is to read, right? Is to read creative things and consume art, right? Like, that's what makes me feel my most innovative. 
right? To read fiction, to listen to music, to go to a gallery. The, you see, the, the, the link between tech and commerce and science and art uh, is, is one that, that, that can't be separated. That, that is, the purpose of art is to, is to make us our most creative selves either in doing it, in expressing it, in consuming it. Um, and so I would say, listen to all of our podcasts and use our productivity apps, but, but interact with art and the natural environment, and that's going to make us our most innovative. Kind of like return to the source. Yes. Yes, and then you can move from there. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, Minister Cattle, thank you so much for being here. I don't know if we throw it to the... I'm not sure if we're throwing it to the audience for questions, but if not... It's been wonderful chatting with you. Thank you, my pleasure. Thank you, everyone, for Thank being you. here. Thanks. And enjoy the rest of the evening. <laughs> oh, yeah. Questions. Leave the floor open for Q&A. Does anyone have a question for the minister? Any questions for the minister? No, Any man. We'll talk, we'll talk over drinks. We'll the talk min over the drinks. minister said it all. She <laughs> said it all. <laughs> well, thank you for your time and attention. And we go back into the wall garden so that we can climb together.